Okay, um, we'll make a start. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 24th meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in 2017. Um, I would remind members and others in the room to switch off phones and uh, other devices to silent. Um, this morning we have apologies from Joanne Lamont. Um, and there are no other apologies. So we'll move straight to agenda item one. Um, which is consideration of continued petitions. Um, the first item on our agenda is consideration of continued petitions, and, and the first petition is uh, PE 1602 by Carol Sunnox on ECGs and heart echo tests with antenatal care. Our last consideration of this petition was in September last year when we agreed to defer further consideration pending publication of updated guidance on cardiac disease and pregnancy by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. In April of this year, the Royal College advised that it had decided that there was no requirement to update its guidance on cardiac disease and pregnancy, as NICE is developing guidelines on intrapartum care for women with pre-existing medical conditions or obstetric complications and their babies. The Royal College indicated its hope that these guidelines will become the up-to-date reference for clinicians. Now, in her submission, the petitioner highlights her view that the scope of the guidelines being developed by NICE centres on pre-existing conditions or obstetric complications. But, and I quote, there is nothing that looks at antenatal care that includes ruling really out the possibility of peripartum cardiomyopathy, end quote, which women develop as a result of pregnancy. She argues that the introduction of a blood test would allow for in-depth testing and treatment before a woman goes into labour by identifying any indicators of potential peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, the NICE website includes project information and documents and indicates that it expects to consult on the draft guidance from the 6th of September to the 18th of October next year with an expected publication date of the 6th of March 2019. So, can I open it up to members? Um, do you have any comments or suggestions for further action? Brian? I, I think it's in, 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 the, in the outset, I think it's quite difficult for us to do anything um, with this uh, until such times as nice guidelines come out. However, um, I, do th I do think it's. Uh, Perfectly possible for this committee to write to that uh, uh, to Nice when they're developing these guidelines and bringing this petition uh, to their attention and uh, the concerns of the petitioner to their attention. Um, I'm not quite sure what else we can do while uh, they're developing the guidelines apart from apart from that. Yeah. Michelle Valentine. I would agree. I think we should write to NICE and ask them to consider the inclusion of um, looking at how they manage people who don't have a pre-existing condition and recognising that, that it can um, occur during pregnancy. Um, and then I think we have to, this time, probably close the petition. And then once the NICE guides come, guidelines come out, if the petitioner still feels that, that it's missing, she can always come back. Okay. Yeah, I, I just agree really with, with both of those actions. I think um, we, we need to wait until we, we see what the guidelines are, um, close the petition, and then there's, you know, um, and take it from there. If the petitioner wants to come back, then she can do that. But I agree with, with them, Brian, saying, you know, that please draw NICE's attention to this petition so that they can take that into consideration. Okay, <clears throat> thanks. Um, I think we've got consensus uh, around the table. I think there's a lot of merit in, in writing to NICE. Um, but to also close the petition on the basis that NICE is developing guidelines which will be issued for consultation in 2018 with an anticipated publication date of March 2019. Um, in doing so, um, I, I think we should also bring the petitioner's attention to the fact that there's a facility for people to register their interest in the development of the guidelines. And if she's not satisfied at the conclusions that are reached by NICE, um, she's uh, perfectly entitled to, to bring back a petition in the same or similar terms in the future. So we're agreed to take that action uh, to write to NICE, uh, but also to close the petition. Agreed. Thank you. 
If we can move on to petition PE1626, the regulation of bus services. Uh, this petition is by Pat Rafferty on behalf of Unite Scotland on the regulation of uh, bus services. We last considered this petition in June uh, when we agreed to ask the Scottish Government to provide an indicative timescale for its consultation on the proposed transport bill and to engage with the petitioners at an early stage of that consultation. Uh, the Scottish Government indicated that officials would meet with UNITE uh, to discuss the proposals for bus services prior to publication of the consultation and again, again following the publication. <coughs> Excuse me. It advised that the consultation would be published in the autumn. Now, the note by the clerk indicates that the consultation ran from 13th of September until the 5th of December. It also identifies that the petitioners have not been in a position to provide a response to the Scottish Government's two most recent submissions, but have indicated that they would be keen to, to proceed with the petition. Uh, do members have any comments or suggestions for further action? Yeah, I think we should invite the petitioners to respond, because I think until we hear what they think, I'm not sure where we'll go at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, they have said they, they, they are keen to um, provide a written response in the new year. So I think we we wait until they do that and then and take it from there. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Um, it's agreed then, and I would encourage um, the petitioners to uh, submit um, their uh, views at an early date, um, and then we will look at it at a, a forthcoming meeting. Okay, thank you. Can we move on to petition P1629, MRI scans for ocular melanoma sufferers in Scotland? Um, at our, it's, uh, the petition is by Jennifer Lewis, um, and at our previous consideration of this petition in June, uh, we agreed to invite NICE and the Scottish Government to respond to the petitioner's argument that recent clinical trials have brought new evidence to light. NICE considered that it would not be appropriate to comment on any aspect of the petition, as it's not, uh, produced, it, it hasn't produced guidance uh, on, the issue, on the use of MRI scans for ocular melanoma sufferers. Um, the Scottish Government considered that there's, and I quote, not sufficient evidence to enact a change in surveillance protocols for people with ocular melanoma, end quote. Uh, we also invited the Scottish Government to respond to the petitioner's view that guidelines are interpreted flexibly by centres elsewhere in the UK and that they will provide MRI scans if requested. The Scottish Government presented its understanding that MRI scans are offered in a limited capacity. Uh, the petitioner considers that the number of hospitals that offer MRI scans upon referral or request represents more than a limited capacity, in her words, and notes that others will also provide MRI if the circumstances and concerns with regard to uh, metastasis are explained to them. She contends that this is not provided to patients in Scotland even when they explain the situation. Uh, the Scottish Government provided further information in relation to the formation of a UK-wide group which will share expertise and develop UK-wide guidance and recommendations to ensure a consistent approach to screening and surveillance. Uh, the petitioner and Ocumel UK queried the benefit of such a group. Ocumel UK considers that this work had already been completed by the Guideline Development Group, which produced guidelines approved but not published by NICE in 2013. Ocumel UK stated its concern that as the new UK-wide group is yet to be formed, it, and I quote, could considerably, considerably delay any advances in care for patients in Scotland, end quote. From late October, there have been further submissions which set out concerns about what are referred to as negative developments with regard to the provision of scanning services in Scotland. The concerns are that patients are now required to attend their ultrasound appointments locally rather than at the specialist centre at Gart Naval. And in our submission of the 25th of October, the petitioner identifies three aspects of the role of National Services Division, which she feels are not being met as a consequence of this new approach to the provision of scanning services. So do members have any comments uh, or suggestions for further action? Michelle. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there, there's an, an awful lot of questions here that we need to we need to pursue. Um, that, that it has it has been a, a negative um, response, and there still are no answers. And I note that the group um, that was set up um, in August was in the early stages, and you know, almost six four months on, we're no 
clearer as to what's happened, if anything. So we need to pursue that and find out. We were told we would be kept updated with respect to that, so we need to find out what's happening with that. Um, and also just to, to, to let the right to the Scottish Government and let them know of the petitioners' um, concerns, further concerns, and um, and basically just ask as many questions as we can, because I don't, I don't feel there's been any progression in this petition at all. Michelle? Yeah, it's a really frustrating one when you look at it, because it, 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 it just feels like it's been played ping pong with. Yeah. Um, you know, I, yes, I think we do need to ask more questions, but there's, I feel a very slight reluctance to write again to get another kind of letter back. Um, and I wonder whether there is the option to, to take some evidence around this um, and have an actual conversation. I don't know whether that's feasible. Because um, it, it does feel like we're knocking it back and forth um, and just not getting an answer and then having to write again. Okay, right. I, I've got to say, I'm, I'm, I share that frustration. I think the evidence that we took at the time, I thought was quite compelling. Um, I thought it was very well thought out and quite compelling. So I was quite, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite frustrated by the responses that we've got from this. And uh, I, I, I do feel we've got, to st we've got to stay on this. I think. Our, our only option is to write again, um, probably in stronger terms, it, <laughs> yeah, because I do feel that we're getting, we're just getting kind of batted back, pushed to the side. And as I said, I, I thought the evidence that, that they gave was was quite compelling. I don't mean from the petitioners. <coughs> I mean from the minister no, no, from and ministers. from the chief yeah. medical officer. Yeah, yeah. No, you no, know, no, I, I think we need to be talking to them mm. about why they're why they're you know basically ignoring this. Mm. I is there a, a, a case for for speaking to the CMO on this? Just to, uh, because I'm not I'm not getting a sense of why no, I, I why that that the, the, this petition has been pushed been pushed aside. I'm not yeah. I'm not really getting that feeling from the the, the government response. Well, <coughs> there's, there's certainly nothing to stop us uh, writing direct to the CMO to see what she uh, what 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 her view is. But uh, with regard to taking evidence, I think there's an issue. With regard to the, the workload that the committee already has, um, I'm advised by the clerks that we may not be able to take evidence until possibly the end of March, eh, at the earliest. So um, I think we need to move this forward. And in the meantime, I think we should be be writing eh, to the Scottish government and also separately to the CMO, as Brian Whittle suggested. Could we, I mean, if, if we're writing to the government and we're writing to the CMO, could we be saying that? You know, if 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 we can't resolve this quickly by by um, written communication, then then we will be we will be requiring them to come in front of us, and maybe that will encourage them to to really address the questions mm -hmm. because they know they'd have to come here otherwise. Yeah, I think there's there's a hell of a lot of merit in, in that suggestion. We can include that in in any correspondence. Because I, 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 I am conscious with these petitioners that that. Time is of the essence. This is not a petition that can drag on for years, from a petitioner's point of view. Um, this, this is really, about, this is a life and death petition. And I, I do think we should suggest that we're, we haven't been particularly enamoured with the uh, with the responses from the government at mm -hmm. this, uh, this stage. Okay, I think I think um, there's 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 merit in, in all these suggestions. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, in, within the letter to the Scottish Government, we should uh, seek an update on establishment of the UK-wide group and the development of guidance and recommendations on surveillance, whether the group will include medical oncologists and whether it is aware of the guideline development group. Uh, we should also seek its position on recent peer-reviewed evidence and also seek its response to the more recent concerns expressed by the petitioner uh, and other uh, others in terms of, of where patients should attend for surveillance. So, is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Um, if we can move on to petition PE1632, concessionary transport for carers, uh, by Amanda MacDonald. Um, <coughs> now, at our uh, previous consideration of this petition in June, we agreed to ask the Scottish Government what the estimated cost of introducing concessionary public transport for carers would be. Uh, the committee also agreed to ask COSLA what consideration local authorities had given to the forthcoming duty under the Carers Scotland Act 2016 to 
provide support to carers who meet uh, locally agreed eligibility criteria, and whether this includes any plans to introduce concessionary transport for carers. Uh, this information is outlined uh, in detail um, in the papers. COSLA's written submission stated that the proposed concessionary travel scheme would not be affordable or represent the most effective way to invest public services, uh, public service resources. Uh, the petitioner suggested that if concessionary transport was considered too expensive to be rolled out through the National Concessionary Transport Scheme, then a national flat rate for carers on public transport could perhaps be considered instead. So do members have any comments uh, or suggestions for further action on this petition? Convener. Um, I have I have a, a, a lot a lot of sympathy for this petition. I think that uh, that uh, as we all know, uh, the value of uh, monetary value of the of the job that ca that carers do, and uh, um, I've had the opportunity a couple of times, like we mentioned before, of of um, going along to some, uh, a series of events with carers and. One of the big issues is their ability to uh, to interact and, and uh, with with others, and travel being one of the main issues. So I, I have a lot of sympathy for this uh, petition. I don't quite understand because I don't think there's, there's the cost implications are that high. So I'm, one, I'm surprised at the the response, but I'd certainly like to uh, continue and ask the Scottish government his views on on, on the petitioner's suggestion uh, the introduction introduction of a national flat rate. For carers, at the very least. Okay, Michelle. I have sympathy with it, absolutely. But I mean, this, uh, in some respects, this, this the issue of travel is not just a, about carers. I know this petition is, but we are debating this in so many forums, in so many ways about travel and concessionary travel, um, and it is a problem. It's a problem across the board. It's a problem in rurality, you know, where children can't access activities. It's a problem for carers. It's a problem for older people. Um, and it's a problem in the sense that we are losing a lot of our public transport as well, because as, as the vast majority of people use cars now, um, particularly in rural areas, there's no accessibility. Um, and it, it, obviously the earlier petition is about <laughs> changing the bus transport system as well. Um, so much as I have huge sympathy, I am just not sure that actually we could do anything with this at the moment. Um, the, 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 I suppose, situation with local government, who are the point of, of subsidisation for, for transport, is that, that if anything, they're... they're reducing the amount of subsidy they give at the moment and I can't see that they're going to be able to add to it so I understand where COSLA are coming from it's not that they wouldn't want to support it or that it, it's not even that it's not the right thing to do it's just that at this present stage I just don't think they're going to be able to um, the flat rate is an interesting one because uh, certainly when I was a child there was a flat rate of travel on the bus for young people and a, and a flat rate, and everybody just paid the same. You just got on and you paid the same, you know, whatever distance you went. Um, I actually don't know when or why it was changed, but um, I think what would be interesting is the, the petition we're working on at the front end perhaps needs to go through um, and see where that ends up. And then I think the whole business of transport probably needs to be visited. I, I'm just not sure we can deliver one particular aspect. Yeah, I mean, COSLA are, are clearly and, and, and um, understandably coming at this from a budgetary point of view and, and the restraints on them, and I can understand that. Um, but I do think it would be worthwhile um, asking the Scottish Government for its views on the introduction of a flat rate and whether they would consider that that would be acceptable, um, because I don't think we've gone down that road before. So I think that would be probably... You know, sort of last chance saloon for it, to be quite honest. But because I can't see, um, free, I don't think that, that the free travel what, that the petitioner is asking for is realistic. But and I do have sympathy with it. But I think the flat rate we could ask about. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, um, clearly, there are cost implications, as have been been highlighted by Cosla. But I think this committee would be failing in our duty if we didn't explore the issue of a of a flat rate. So while there's, there's, there is an argument to, to close the petition, uh, I think we should explore the issue of a, a, a flat rate further. Um, 
and uh, I think that's agreed by everyone around the table. So, so that's uh, the next course of action uh, agreed on uh, PE1632. OK, if we can move on to PE1638 by Sean Clarkin on local housing allowance. Uh, brackets bedroom tax two close brackets at our previous consideration of this petition in june we agreed to write to the scottish government and the department for work and pensions um, the uk government has since dropped its plans to introduce local housing allowance rates to the local rented sector and the petitioner has informed the clerks that on, the, on that basis uh, he wishes to withdraw the petition um, so taking that on board, are we content to close the petition or do members have any comments or, or further suggestions? I'm content to close. OK, we're agreed to close that petition and can I thank the petitioner for uh, the action that he took and uh, bringing the issue to the attention of the committee. If we can move on to uh, petition PE1653, Active Travel Infrastructure, uh, by Michaela Jackson on behalf of Gorebridge Community Trust. Um, at our last consideration of this petition in June, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government, SUSTRANS, Scottish Environment Link and WWF Scotland. The Scottish Government's written submission makes reference to a wide range of plans in place to support active travel and cycling in Scotland, including a new trunk road, walking and cycling strategy, which was due to be published in September. Uh, however, members may wish to note that the, the clerks were unable to source the strategy on the Transport Scotland website at the time of preparing the note for this petition. The submissions received from Sustrans and the petitioner raised concerns that the Scottish Government's target of 10% of all journeys being taken by bike by 2020 is unlikely to be met unless a fundamental change is made to the way that, that, infrastructure, uh, that, that, that these infrastructure projects are designed. Um, suggestions made in the written submissions received to improve the chances of this target being met include increased funding, amending the current approach to the appraisal of transport projects and establishing a legal framework for active travel in infrastructure projects. So do members have any comments or suggestions on further action? Um, this this um, submission by the Scottish Government where it says the Trunk Road Cycling Initiative aims to ensure that all major road projects are given careful consideration to suitable provision for all road users. As you will be aware, <laughs> uh, I'm quite involved in the A77 upgrade in the Mabel Bypass and one of the, 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 the questions that I did ask the Minister was, was there going to be a provision made for active travel, to which there isn't. So that particular uh, uh, submission by the Scottish Government is is, uh, is, yeah, is contradictory. So I certainly would like to explore that further because I, I feel quite strongly that, uh, that this petition uh, is certainly going along the right lines. Um, I think if, if we have any infrastructure projects um, and we want to future proof them and we do want to do the 10% sort of, of journeys by, uh, by bike, we have to do that. We have to start join, joined up thinking. So I, I would certainly like to question that from the Scottish right to the Scottish Government on that. And I, I also note that we didn't manage to find that on the website. And I would certainly like to inquire where that is. Yep. OK. Anyone else? No, I, agree. No. I think we should write back to them and say, uh, you know, just what is your position on the legal, you know, on the legal framework. And, OK. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the committee's agreed to to proceed on that basis. Um, I know that uh, the, the, the issue of the 10% target has been raised quite a bit in the chamber. Um, and, uh, and I know that I've discussed it privately with, uh, or, you know, uh, officially with, with uh, Pedal for Scotland and uh, other bodies. Um, I think as, as Stuart Stevenson said in a committee meeting the other day, it, it's always good to set a target high because there's always a, a chance that you can reach it rather than setting a target, a mediocre target. Uh, and and not reaching it. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, um, merit in, in writing to the government to seek uh, further clarification on this. Yes. Is that, that's agreed. Thank you. Okay, if we can move on to petition PE1658, 
um, by Wendy Stephen on compensation for those who suffered a neurological disability following administration of the Placerix vaccine between 1988 and 1992. At our first consideration of this petition in June, we heard evidence from the petitioner and we agreed to seek the views of the Scottish Government and, in light of the historical nature of the issues raised in the petition, to seek the views and further background contextual information from the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency and the Commission on Human Medicines. Uh, submissions from the Scottish Government and the petitioner are uh, included in uh, the papers uh, that you have received from the, the clerk. So the Scottish Government notes the historical context and states that it has no plans to set up a scheme as suggested by the petition on the basis that the issues, on the basis that the issues raised in the petition including safety of medicines, the policy on compensation for vaccines damages and administration of the vaccine damages payment scheme and the policy for payments under that scheme are all reserved to the UK Parliament. The Scottish Government suggests that the committee may wish to contact the Department for Work and Pensions as a body responsible for administration of the vaccine damages payment scheme. Um, now, the petitioner expresses her understanding that any payment under the vaccine damages payment scheme is not the same as compensation, and that by referring to the scheme as compensation, the Scottish Government is causing confusion. She considers that in its submission, the Scottish Government acknowledges the damage caused by the URABI, I think that's the correct, correct pronunciation, containing Placerix vaccine. Uh, she refers to examples of other injuries and disabilities that predate devolution, including hepatitis C, uh, thalidomide, and exposure to asbestos. She considers that these have been acknowledged and compensated, noting in particular the damages asbestos related conditions, Scotland Act 2009. Now, the petitioner considers that it is entirely unacceptable, in her words, for the Scottish Government to not set up a scheme for ex gratia payments as called for in her petition, given the damage caused by the vaccine in this particular instance. So do members have any comments? Um, yes, Rona. If I'm understanding correctly, um, we didn't get anything back from the MHRE or the Commission on Human Medicines. They didn't respond mm. to our request for further information. So I think we should uh, ask them again if they would respond. Um, and most certainly, um, right to the, the DWP, as the Scottish Government suggests, um, okay. and, and see where we go from there. Okay. Anyone else? Brian? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how we close this loop from the petitioner here, who's suggesting that, and I don't know the answer to it, but suggesting that uh, the, 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 the Scottish Government is, is, is being disingenuous um, or causing confusion, whatever is around the, comp the, the idea of compensation. I'm not quite sure how we close that, because I'm not sure whether, whether that's correct or not. But uh, how, do we, how do we do that? Have, I mean, you, you, you refer to the fact that um, we've been advised, but mm -hmm. is, have we taken legal advice on that? No. We could certainly seek it. Yeah, I, I mean, think it, I think it the, might be worth seeking. The government are clear that it's it's a reserve matter, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So, so I mean, that's that 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 would appear to be a fact. But the, but they're also saying that by using the word compensation, it's it's misleading. So we need to explore that one. Yeah, I think we need to put yeah. that back to the Scottish government yeah. and ask them to yeah. to to respond to um, the, the comments by the petitioner. Yep, yeah. I think so. Mm -hmm. well, that, that can close that loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well. That action is agreed and we'll also um, write to the DWP and chase up um, the MHRA and the Commission on Human Medicines for a response. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Okay, if we can move on to petition P1662 um, by Janie uh, Kringen, Kringen, I think, and Lorraine Murray on improved treatment for patients with Lyme disease and associated tick-borne diseases. Um, we first considered this petition in September uh, when we heard evidence from the petitioners and agreed to seek the views of a range of stakeholders. The submissions received are supportive of the petition and discuss a range of issues around testing for, treatment of and education about Lyme disease. Uh, we have a wealth of information which uh, members have had the opportunity to read. Uh, which I'll try to summarise 
as briefly as possible. Um, in relation to testing, uh, the Scottish Government advises that the testing laboratory at Rigmore liaises with experts at Public Health England to ensure access to the most robust and scientifically justified testing regime available. Uh, however, the Scottish Government recognises that there are gaps in the effectiveness of the tests and notes that uh, NICE guidelines, which are expected to include consideration of the effectiveness of testing, are currently in development and will be considered by the Lyme borreliosis subgroup once published, and this is expected to be in April 2018. Uh, the Royal College of General Practitioners in Scotland is represented on the group developing the NICE guidelines and adds that it's taking forward work with the University of Leicester on a new research method of blood tests. Lyme Disease UK and Lyme Disease Action refer to uncertainty and complexity uh, and patients being caught in the middle due to the current limitations of NHS blood tests. Lyme Disease UK considers that testing should be extended and suggests upgrading the testing laboratory at Rigmore to a reference laboratory and extending its remit to cover all tick-borne infections. Uh, and the Scottish Government notes that this is under consideration. All of the submissions acknowledge the need for greater awareness and education among both the public and professionals. The Scottish Government, Scottish Natural Heritage and the Royal College of General Practitioners highlight a range of work being taken forward, including the development of professional resources such as podcasts and webinars and appropriate information resources on websites including Health Protection Scotland. The Royal College provides information about its e-learning course, which has registered over 2,000 users since its launch in September 2014. Uh, and the Royal College notes it is difficult to measure the percentage of Scottish GPs who have completed the training, as the course is not restricted to a GP or Scottish-only audience. The petitioners indicate that they are encouraged by the general agreement among the responses that more needs to be done to tackle Lyme disease. Uh, they do, however, express a disappointment with the draft NICE guidelines, which they consider to be very narrow in scope. The petitioners welcome support for the suggestion of a special, specialist treatment centre and the argument for pilot specialist clinics, and they also strongly support the elevation of the testing laboratory status to reference laboratory. The petitioners summarise the response, response with suggested actions which they indicate they would like to see taken forward within a Scottish national plan for tick-borne infections, similar to that developed in France. The petitioners also draw their, our attention to the, the, the French national plan. So that was a brief summary. <laughs> um, do members have any comments or suggestions for further action? Oh, and uh, before we move to, to members, can I uh, welcome Alexander uh, Burnett, who has joined us. Uh, he's, he's had a significant interest in this issue uh, for some time. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask you to come in later in, uh, once we've uh, had contributions from the members. Um, Brian? Can be that, I mean, it's quite interesting in sort of the, the, that NICE himself uh, are, are, are suggesting there's currently insufficient uh, quality of evidence. So the, there's a recognition here that uh, the more has to be done, and, and given that the the, uh, the guidelines are expected to be published in 2018, April 2018, um, I would suggest that we would defer further consideration until that point, uh, given that their recognition that it's not that, that the current system is not robust enough, and to see how they're going to tackle that. Okay, um, I, I Rona. agree. Um, I mean, I think. Um, given that you know, it's a matter of months till we get the, the new guidelines from NICE, it would be, I'm not sure it would be um, productive for us to do anything until that, because we can consider where we go after we, we see those guidelines. Okay. And can I um, just check, have we flagged NICE these concerns? Yeah. So we, d we did flag it, yeah, so they're aware of the... Mm -hmm. the um, I mean, obviously, we've got to see what they do. The draft obviously wasn't great, but, you know, hopefully they might have revisited it. That's why I just wanted to ensure that we have actually flagged to them. Um, so, yeah, we're going to have to see what they publish. Um, I'm concerned if they don't broaden them a wee bit. Mm -hmm. Because Lyme disease is pretty awful. 
Okay, yeah. Can I ask Alexander Burnett <coughs> to come in at this point? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, convener, and can I thank the petitioners for continuing uh, bringing this very important subject uh, to the committee. Um, I think it's very disappointing. Um, you know, we're having to wait till April uh, to see uh, something which we're expecting to not be uh, uh, satisfactory. Um, I think the, you know, this is a subject which has been through Parliament I think, over 10 years ago. I think it was the first time we found uh, records of uh, cross-party groups or events happening uh, to, to highlight it. Um, clearly, since then, nothing significant no significant progress has been made. You know, the evidence shows that you know, in the sort of four years, only, only 3% of uh, GPs have taken up the, the, uh, uh, the courses available. Um, you know, the disease becomes ever more prevalent, uh, and the risks uh, to uh, uh, very important groups of people who we are encouraging to use uh, and go into the countryside are, are increasing all the time, uh, from, from children on, on school groups and Duke of Edinburgh schemes, um, uh, the increase in, in walkers. Uh, I'm sure I don't need to you know, go on at length about that, but you know, we're encouraging people to go out into the countryside and they're going back uh, to, to urban areas uh, where the disease is not being recognised uh, and, and still uh, very little seems to be done about it. So yeah, I do understand that you know, four months yeah, might not seem a long time uh, uh, to wait for uh, what is the next stage, uh, but if we're already expecting that next stage to to not be satisfactory, I think it's going to seem an awfully long time uh, to the to the petitioners and those else, the others who have been campaigning with them. So, yeah, I'd be d disappointed if if that's the only course of action. I'm afraid I don't know what else was within the remit of a uh, petitions committee, but you know. You know, you know, the petitioners have put forward uh, you know, proposals and suggested actions uh, for a Scottish national plan for tick-borne infections, uh, and I just wondered if the committee could uh, uh, push that in any way. I don't know how that comes about. Is it by requesting the government to bring forward plans for, for such a plan? Brian? I just think, I mean, Arthur Burnett makes, makes, makes some good points, and I think I'd certainly, at the very least, um, uh, we, we surely it's within our uh, remit to be able to write to NICE with the concerns around the draft, uh, the draft proposals to say that we don't feel that they're tackling enough or, ta or, or tackling in enough of the issue or, or as a broader scope of the issue. That, that must be perfectly within our remit to be able to do that. Yeah. I suppose the point here is, is and, and I totally take on board what Alexander's saying about you know, having to wait for NICE. But actually, until we see what NICE writes, we can't demand the change. It's sort of a catch-22, isn't it, really? Because the, the guidelines, you can write to NICE and say, you should be looking at this and you should be doing this. Um, and the, the draft is not satisfactory, and we need to, you know, see that. But we can't make demands uh, of the government. We can highlight them. I think we already have highlighted that this needs to be reviewed. But they're going to say automatically, well, we'll see what NICE say. You know, so we're going to go around in circles until NICE publish. Um, and only once NICE have published, and, and indeed, if, it, if, if, as you suspect, it's not going to be satisfactory, then we can say, this is not satisfactory and we need to do something different. Um, I yeah, I mean, I largely agree with that. The government w won't do anything until, until April in that sense, but I, I think there's some merit actually in, in writing to NICE again to say that you know that, that the draft the draft doesn't seem satisfactory, and could you take this into consideration before final publication? I, I mean I don't see that that's you know I think that's going to be possibly worthwhile, but I don't think it's I mean clearly that nothing will happen, uh, concrete will happen until the, the until April, but I think it's worth flagging up. Um, I know. We, we probably did, but it's worth again saying that we've had this meeting, and you know there's significant concerns about the, the guidelines, and, and perhaps they could take that into consideration because it's not finalised yet. Brian, I think if if we preempt um, sort of nice publication by suggesting that the draft publication uh, doesn't meet what we were hoping, um, they'll they'll at least know that this is not going to go away. <laughs> And then they have to, yeah. then they're going to at some point have to revisit it. So yeah. maybe by preempting it with a with a, a letter to NICE, at the very least. Okay, okay. Alexander, ready to come back in? I think, think well, the, you know, the, the delay till 
the nice report is disappointing. It's, it is understandable, and I think you know, everyone will understand the committee's position on that. Uh, I just wondered, is there anything that can be done about uh, pushing for the Scottish National Plan and those actions? Okay, well, again, it might be an idea to wait for the NICE guidelines um, to come out um, before, before that's pursued. Would you agree? I don't think the government commit to that until no. they've seen the NICE guidelines. Yeah. So we're kind of yeah. in a catch-22 situation yeah. at the moment. We really have to wait until April, yeah. um, until the uh, NICE guidelines um, um, c come out. But I, I would share the petitioner's disappointment and, and members' disappointment with, with the narrowness of the, the, the current uh, NICE guidelines. But there's certainly um, a need to, to write to NICE just to make sure that uh, our views are, are on the radar. Uh, in advance of uh, of April 2018. Um, would it be worth, I mean, if, if we are sort of anticipating that there is, we're not going to get what we want from NICE, uh, is it worth actually, um, I suppose, scheduling um, a meeting evidence for very, very close to when, soon after they come out, so that we've actually ring-fenced the time so that we can address it very quickly and maybe, you know, sort of potentially ring, you know, save the date for people we might want to take evidence from so that there isn't then another delay when NICE comes out and then we have to schedule in sort of down the line. So at least that way we're not letting it drag out any longer than it has to. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I, I do think it's really frustrating and none of us want to have to wait till April, but I think there's just a, a pragmatic realism in that. Um, but if we could concertina the process a wee bit by planning ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we can ask the clerks to, to take note of that and, and they can come back uh, to a future meeting with a proposal for um, ring fencing sometime uh, for that uh, evidence session. But I agree with you 100%. Uh, um, this has been dragging on for, <coughs> for too long and uh, it, it needs, to be, needs to be sorted, to coin a phrase. So, um, are there any other comments on this uh, at the moment? So we're, sorry, Michelle. I suppose I would, I would just say if, we, if we're going to sort of plan ahead, it, it might be worth um, even asking the petitioners who, who they think we should be taking evidence from, obviously not only themselves, but, mm. but other individuals that they would particularly feel would be relevant. Okay, I think the clerks will, will, will mm. take that on board uh, as, as a matter of course. Um, so uh, we're agreed with that uh, course of action uh, and can I thank the petitioners for their uh, response to this uh, very serious issue um, that I, I've been following for a number of years myself. So um, look forward to progress on it in the near future. If we can move on to petition PE1664, uh, it's a continued petition uh, on greater protection for mountain hares by Harry Hayton on behalf of one kind. Um, at our last consideration of this petition in September, we agreed to write to the Scottish Government, SNH, Scottish Land and Estates, and James Hutton Institute, uh, and the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust. Uh, members will note that some of the submissions received made reference to the fact that SNH recently conducted a review of existing evidence on mountain hare populations. Uh, the findings concluded that evidence of a national decline in mountain hares is not conclusive, but North East Scotland data shows a dramatic decline in numbers since 2003. Uh, as there is no evidence of a long-term decline overall, the Scottish Government does not support a nationwide moratorium on mountain hare culls. However, the petitioner is of the view that, given the lack of evidence available, uh, the unregulated and unmonitored killing of mountain hares should not be allowed to continue. SNH intends to address the status of hares on North East Grouse moors, moors through the new principles of moorland management guidance on sustainable hare management, eh, which is currently being drafted by the Moorland Forum. However, the petitioner raised concerns that there has been no consultation outside of the forum membership or transparency as to how the guidance is being developed. The Scottish Government also intends to set up an independently led group to examine how to ensure grouse moor management is sustainable and compliant with the law and the control of mountain hares will be considered as part of this review. So do members have any comments or suggestions for further action? 
Brian. Um, I, I think I think the obvious one uh, convenient is the fact that uh, the, the concerns raised by the, the petitioner around their inability to participate in any kind of uh, in the, the guidance. I think perhaps one of the obvious things for me would be to to you know ask the Scottish government what uh, how they can allow uh, con contributions from from you know the public mm -hmm. on, on that guidance. So we're agreed to ask the Scottish Government what opportunity there may be for members of the public to contribute to the development of the principles of Moorland management guidance uh, and for more information about the scope of the independent group uh, on grouse moor management in relation to the control of mountain hares. Okay. That's agreed. Um, if we can... Uh, move on to um, petition PE1681 uh, on adult consensual incestuous relationships and marriage. This is in similar terms to two previous petitions lodged by the same petitioner. Uh, the most recent petition was considered by us at our meeting on the 15th of September 2016. At that meeting, we agreed to close the petition on the basis that the Scottish Law Commission undertook a report on this issue as recently as 2007 and concluded that the majority view at the time favoured retaining the offence and the current definition. So do members have any comments? I would close the petition. Okay. The question has been asked and answered already, so I think we you know, just close it. I think we should close it. I don't see any merit in it whatsoever. OK, we're agreed to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders on the basis that the Scottish Law Commission undertook a report on this issue as recently as 2007 and concluded that the majority view at the time favoured retaining the offence and the current definition. The petition is closed. OK, we've come to the end of consideration of petitions in public. Uh, although we have one further petition, uh, PE 1458, uh, to discuss in private. Um, in closing this meeting, I'd like to, to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Uh, and can I also take this opportunity to thank the clerks and all those who have worked behind the scenes to support the committee's work over the past year. Uh, their assistance is greatly appreciated, and uh, I hereby close the public part of this meeting. Thank you.